Well, good morning. Good to see all of you here this morning. It is a privilege to be with you. I have to wonder if God has favorites. Have you ever wondered that? Does he have favorite children? Does he have favorite churches? Because according to Revelations, it looks like he has some favorites. And I believe Woodman Valley Chapel has to be on his favorites list. You guys are the best. I mean that. It has been awesome to be here so far this weekend and to be with you again and to worship by looking at God's word is a privilege. I work at Mission Hills, which is down in Denver, not too far. Uh, We love you. We love teaming with you. We think of you and pray for you often. You guys are on our hearts and in our minds, and so we will continue to do that and and, uh, just to be here with you. I've been looking forward to this day for months, so to look at God's word with you will be really exciting. Colorado Springs is is a little bit in my blood. I I was uh, born to a dad who went to the Air Force Academy and flew C-130s and was in the Air Force. I was born in Abilene, Texas, where he was serving at the time. He played on the Air Force Academy football team here. And so coming to games, we've done that uh, most of our growing up life and enjoyed that. I lived in Castle Rock for a portion of my life. And then most of my life have been in Littleton, Colorado though I spent about seven years pastoring and going to school in Chicago. Uh, But it's great to be back. And so many memories of childhood come back to me by by being in the Springs or even driving up here through Castle Rock. I was thinking about a game my dad used to play with us when we were kids. My dad had this way of taking childhood games and twisting them to to make them more fun, at least for him. Uh, So like a game like hide and seek became hide, seek and scare, okay? And the point of the game was that everyone would go hide into the house and, and you had to try and find them and scare them before they could reach out of the darkness and scare you, right? So you can see how that would be fun for him, but not for me as a seven-year-old kid. And I was the oldest of four children, so somehow I was always it. You know, I was always the first guy to go, so they would go hide in the house, my siblings and my dad, and I'd stand there shaking with my flashlight and count to 50 and finally bolt up the stairs to go find them. My brother, he's just not the brightest crayon in the box, okay? He, he always hid in the same place as if I wouldn't eventually figure it out. He always went to the linen closet. He would go to the top shelf of the linen closet, but as he got bigger, that proved to be difficult. And so there he is on the top shelf. I open the door to scare him. I go, bah! He goes, ah! And boom, 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 boom. All the shelves fall down. Towels are everywhere. I'm like, dude, mom's going to kill us. My sister's. They always hid in their room because it's, it's safer there. There's stuffed animals to protect them. So they would hide under the covers. Yes, under the covers. So there would be a lump. So you, you could tell that they were under. And as if the lump wasn't enough to give it away, they would just keep talking. Because <laughs> sisters always talk, right? So they're, they're talking under the covers. They're like, do you think he's coming? I think he's coming. I'd look at my brother, I'd be like, Jake, this is too easy, man. Let's just, on the count of three, jump on the bed and scare them after death. So I'd go, one, two, three. We'd jump on the bed, they'd scream. My youngest sister, Joy, always peed her pants, right? <laughs> Stop the whole game, change Joy. <laughs> then we'd go looking for my dad. Now, now my dad, as I said, he, he played for the Air Force Academy football team. He, He's a large man, okay? I refer to him as a massive chunk of humanity, all right? He's, he's not a small man. And he's, he, he, he would go hide, and I think he just took a nap during the whole game, right? He's, he's hiding. We're, we're going through the house. Dad, you can come out now. Dad, where are you? You know, we started flipping on lights. That was against the rules, but we didn't care because we thought a monster ate our dad. <laughs> Finally, we started looking places we knew he couldn't fit, like the hair dryer and the toaster oven. <laughs> and then out of nowhere, my dad would tackle all four of us to the ground, and we would all be screaming, joyed pee your pants again. You know, this <laughs> is great, great childhood memories. It's a game that I used to play with my dad, but, but you know, as I've gotten older, I've realized it's a lot like a game I play with God. I walk through the dark hallways of this life, and doubt and fear set in, and I start saying, God, where are you? And God, you can come out now. God, please show yourself to me. Are you even Here, God, wondering where he is in the midst of life and all the turns and corners that it seems to throw at us. It reminds me of a quote that C.S. Lewis wrote. He said this, he said, There comes a moment when children who have been playing at a burglar's hush, suddenly, was that a real footstep in the hall? There comes a moment when people have been dabbling in religion, which is man's search for God, suddenly draw back. Suppose we really found him. We never meant it to come to that. Worse still, suppose that he found us. 
being found by God can be a terrifying thought to some of us. Being found in the midst of our guilt or in the midst of the things that we've done can, can make us draw back and go, no, I don't know if I want to be found. I'm, I'm comfortable in my doubt. I'm comfortable in my sin. I'm comfortable in my fear. But imagine for a moment that God really exposed himself to you and all of his worth to you. How would that change your life? And let's flip the table. What if you were absolutely honest with God? What if you exposed everything to him in your life that maybe you've been hiding for some time? Would your life be different? The title of my message today is Honest to God, Becoming Brutally Honest with a Gracious God. And I I think that sometimes we hide like a child hiding under a bucket in, in our dishonesty from God. And so the question that I pose to you is, are you hiding in your dishonesty? Are there things you're holding back from God in your relationship to him that you think he doesn't know? And oh, by the way, he knows everything. (laughs) But isn't it funny that we live like he doesn't know everything? So we only tell him some things. We only expose some things. We only let God go so far in our life. And then we go talk to someone else or, or just keep it our own little secret, all the while hiding in our dishonesty. I started down a journey some years ago of of learning what it meant to be honest with God. I was sitting in a college classroom with Dr. Schmutzer. I was in front of the class and he said, did you know that you can be absolutely honest with God and your honesty will be the beginning of transformation? He said that at the beginning of a three-hour night class and I don't think I heard anything for the next two hours and 59 minutes. I just thought about what it would be like if I was honest with God and could that bring true transformation? I doodled on my paper all the things I'd been dishonest about, maybe hiding from God. I started to dare to believe that if I would expose everything, that he could change my life completely. I talked to a few of my buddies at college, said, will you go on this journey of honesty with me? Will you, will you just start saying everything to God and see what happens? Sure enough, we all started doing that and found that our lives were being transformed. I thought maybe there's something to this. Maybe if I really am absolutely honest with God, he can change my life completely. So I created this postcard that said, if you could say anything to God and know you wouldn't be sent to hell for doing so, what would you say? I got a P.O. box. I put the address on the back. I started leaving these postcards all over the country. I'd travel and speak different places. I'd leave them in the back of churches and hymnals and inside of churches. I'd leave them in books and bookstores. I'd leave them in bathroom airports and 7-Eleven gas stations. I left these cards everywhere just in hopes that someone would be honest and say what they needed to say to God, and that would be the beginning of their life being transformed. All of a sudden, these postcards started coming back to me. They don't have return addresses, so I never got in touch with the people. Anonymously, they were sending these honest things they would want to say to God if they knew they could say anything. My hope is that on the other side of that postcard, there is a person that wrote down something to God and realized that they can say anything, that their life can be transformed by simply getting it out on the table to allow God to do something with it. And that's my hope for you this morning. I'm going to encourage you to be gut-wrenching honest with God. I'm going to give you some practical things today that will help you do that, but I'm also going to identify the roadblocks that stand in the way of you being absolutely honest with God. This sermon is topical in nature. I'm only here one Sunday, so I don't have time to go through a whole book or a passage, so I'm going to look at all sorts of different passages, and we're going to do that together. You might want to write some of these down. You're welcome to look them up or read them with me on the screen. You might want to have something to write down with, because I'm going to give you a lot today that will be good for you to mull over the rest of this week. Let's start by defining honesty. Honesty is is being free of deceit. It's, It's being free of untruthfulness. It's completely sincere, simple, unpretentious, and unsophisticated. You've met the person like this, right? That they're just honest with you. They just, they just say it as it is and, and you kind of like that. You're attracted to their honesty. Sometimes you're like, wow, did you really just say that? But for the most part, you really like it. You, you've met honest people because there are those people and I love them. I'm, I've met a lady here this weekend serving. That she's, been, she's been awesome. She's honest and forthright. It's been great to work with her. I love people like that. We're attracted to people that are honest, that are unsophisticated, that are, that, that are truthful Here's what honesty is not. Honesty is not to shock, to grab attention, to expose something that shouldn't be. 
for the sake of getting others to look at me. Honesty is not like that guy my junior year of high school that ran across the football field buck naked with a bag over his head. He was a streaker, right? He, he put a bag over his head, ran across the football field, got to the other side, jumped in a car, and they squealed off, and we saw the rent-a-cop slowly chase after him, right? <laughs> to shock, to grab attention, to expose what shouldn't be. That's what honesty is not. not. Not for the sake of transformation. Here's what honesty is. Honesty is facing reality. It's the first step toward truth. It's exposing to God what may be messy, are not fun to say or brutal. It's relieving in some ways because you're saying it to the God who already knows all of it, but it's for the sake of transformation. Dr. Schmutzer said it best this way when he said, honesty is not an end in itself, but a means to transformation. Honesty can just be something where we say it and wow, that feels better, that's out in the open. Or True honesty, especially with God, can be saying something and not letting that be the end in itself, but allowing it to be a means to our true transformation. I believe there are six major roadblocks in our life as it relates to being honest with God. There are six things that stand in the way, at least for me, but I'm certain these will probably apply for you, that that keep us from being brutally honest with God. I believe the first is guilt. Guilt is one of the major roadblocks that stands in the way of me saying everything that I need to say to God. Guilt builds a cement wall around our life that doesn't allow him to put in his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness right where I need it the most. You know the feelings of guilt, right? The feelings where you know you've done something wrong and you just feel dirty for it. You feel like you're used goods, like there's no way that God can use you and all your purposes because you, you know the sin you did and you think he doesn't know, but guess what? He does know and he so badly wants to give you grace and mercy and forgiveness, but you stay in your guilt, this feeling of guilt and shame and you don't allow his grace to break through. Remember the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3? In Genesis chapter 3, we see this story of of the first of all creation, Adam and Eve, hiding in the garden from God. It says, And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. They sinned. They did exactly what God told them not to do. They ate of the tree that he said, do not eat of this tree. They ate of it. They knew they were in trouble. So they hid. God's walking in the garden looking for them. Quick pop quiz. How many of you think God knew where they were? Yeah, right. Probably all. Like, God knew, right? God wasn't real. Like, he, he, he wasn't confused about where they were. He didn't go, where did they go? Right? He knew where they were the whole time. But how gracious was he in this passage? It says that he was looking for them and he asked this question, where are you? It was like an invitation. Saying, come out. Come out of your guilt. Come out of your shame. I already know what you did. Come out and join me again Guilt is this feeling that we have to something we've done in the past. Shame is often this feeling we have or something for something that we know is wrong that's going on in the present. Whether it's guilt or whether it's shame, we hide and it becomes a roadblock in our honesty with God. It makes me think about my four-year-old son. He, he's learning life's lessons. He's, he's learning that I don't accept lying. Lying is not okay. Uh, it's, of all the things I discipline for, lying's at the top of the list. So this one night, he's hanging out with his grandparents, which are my parents. He's hanging out at my mom and dad's house, and they're wrestling and having a good time. And, and he turns to my sisters, and he says to my sisters, my four-year-old son says to my adult grown sisters, you're fat. <laughs> yeah, right? So I, it was shocking. My mom, being the good grandma that she was, she, she takes my son to the side and says, we're going to talk about this. We don't do this. Now, now, let me just tell you, you don't know my sisters, but if you knew my sisters, you would know they are not fat. They are very physically fit. They, they actually enjoy going to the gym. There's others of us in the family that 
have other passions and skills, okay? So they, they enjoy, they, they love working out and they're very physically fit. So he calls them, he, I don't think he even knew what fat was, but my, my grandma, or my, excuse me, my mom, his grandma talks to him and says, we don't do that. We don't call people that. But when she dropped him off that night, he, she said, listen, this is what happened. I just want you to know, but you don't need to do anything about it. I've taken care of it. I said, okay, great, no problem. Two days later, we're in the van. I got Grace, my daughter, who's two, and my son, Chandler, who's four, in the van. I say, guys, do you know what fat is? And, and they said, no. And I really think they didn't know. I really think, yeah, I have no idea what, what that word meant. And so I said, guys, we would never call anyone fat, right? And they're like, no, no, we'd never do that, right? <laughs> Grace, would, did, would you ever call someone fat? No, daddy, no, I would not call someone fat. Okay, I believe you. Chandler, would you ever call someone fat? Have, have you ever called someone fat? Ever, like, ever done that? No, dad, no, I've not done that. I've not done that. <laughs> so now as a parent, I'm in a rock and a hard place, right? Because I know what happened, and he's saying he didn't do that. So I'm thinking, it's about two minutes goes by, I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do. All of a sudden from the back seat, I hear him say, dad, did grandma tell you something? <laughs> <laughs> I go, I go, Chandler, what would grandma have told me? Dad, this is not a game. Did grandma tell you something? <laughs> guilty, right? He's guilty. He had guilt in his life. We know what that's like from the time we're children all the way till we're adult. And guilt can be a major, major roadblock in our honesty with God. God wants to impart freedom. He wants to give us uh, freedom from the guilt and the shame that is our, our life, but we have to be honest with him and completely open. We'll talk about that more in a moment. The next roadblock, I think, that stands in the way of our honesty with God is depression. Depression is a very, very real thing, and I have no doubt that there are people here today that are dealing with depression. I serve as a pastor and a biblical counselor. I sit and counsel people many hours during the week, and some of them are struggling with depression. I know that it is real. But I do believe that depression can be a major roadblock in our honesty with God. What do you mean, you're asking? Isn't that, isn't that something we just feel because life's dealt us a bad hand? No, listen, when, when you are so down and depressed, your depression becomes your focus, not the God who can save you from your depression. When you get to the point where you just feel like, like you're overwhelmed, like you've broken every expectation that's been out there for you, like life is out of control, you can be in this place where you lose perspective that God's completely in control and he can impart things into your life that will break you free of that depression. But when you stay here, you're looking only at the circumstances or the people in front of you and you're not allowing true honesty to happen in your relationship with God. It reminds me of Hannah in the Bible. Hannah was this girl, maybe you remember her story in Samuel. She was this girl who struggled with infertility, a real thing. I know many people struggle with that today. And they longed so badly for God to open their womb, just like Hannah did. She wanted to have a baby. And here's Hagar just pestering her and, and making fun of her because of her barrenness. And for Samuel 1 through 7, or 1, 7 through 10, it says, Hannah wept and would not eat. She was so depressed. And then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? And listen to what he says. He says, am I not more to you than ten sons? You're so depressed. You're forgetting me. You're, you're forgetting God. You've lost all perspective. Am I not worth more to you than 10 sons? You see, depression affects the person who is depressed, but it also affects everybody around them. Dep depression can be a huge roadblock in our honesty. The next roadblock that stands in the way of us being honest with God is that of pride. When we're prideful, when we think that we are God and, and he is not, when we think that we're the masters of our own destiny, as Justin Timberlake put it, and we think we've got our whole life under control and we're prideful and we're living narcissistic. We're not allowing ourselves to be honest with God and, and allowing him to be the king of our life. We're putting ourselves on the throne, not him on the throne. Pride's a funny thing, right? It's like bad breath. Everybody else knows you have it but you, right? <laughs> it's right. Like we walk around prideful and, and all of a sudden it's how we are with, our, with God and we think we're telling him things and informing him things. 
It's, it's wrong. It's not okay to be prideful. It reminds me of King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 1 through 4. You can read his story, this powerful king. He thought he was the greatest. And one day, walking on the edge of his kingdom, looking out at everything that he had made, he starts talking about how great he is. He says, look at how great I am. And God says, oh, yeah, let me show you what I think of you. And he turns him into a beast of the field or, the, or like an ox, the Bible says. He literally was out in the field growing hair like feathers of a bird, it says. These nails like talons. He, he was eating grass with the ox. Can you imagine driving in your chariot with your kids? And your kid's like, look, cow, 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 King Nebuchadnezzar, cow. Right? It'd be weird, but for years he was turned into looking like a beast. Because God wanted to show him, listen, I'm God, you're not. I oppose the proud, but give grace to the humble. We cannot be prideful, nor can we let pride stand as a roadblock in our life. The next roadblock in our honesty with God is that of fear. When we're afraid of something, when when we're afraid of people, when we're afraid of circumstances, maybe we're afraid of failure. We think that we're going to fail and it's all going to be over. We're going to be found out as, as an imposter. And so we live in this fear and we don't allow our fear to be spoken publicly to other people or to God. It literally paralyzes us. We do something in the moment that we wish we would never do. But all of a sudden we find ourselves doing, like Paul said, I, I do what I don't want to do. I think of the Apostle Peter, who in John 13 promised that he would be loyal to Christ. When Christ explained that he would have to be crucified and taken away, he said, no, listen, over my dead body will they take you. And then five chapters later, we see Peter denying Christ three times in fear for his own life. We do this, don't we? We're so afraid of other people or afraid of circumstances that we're spiritually schizophrenic. We say say one thing, then we believe one thing, and then we act a completely different way. I think the core issue here is that we don't fear God. We might be afraid of God, but we don't fear God. If we had the right perspective of God, we would fear only him. The Bible tells us time and again, fear the Lord, fear the Lord, fear the Lord your God. When you're afraid of God, you're like a kid coloring on the wall, hoping that your parent doesn't catch you. And when you're caught, you feel afraid. I got caught doing something I shouldn't. But when you fear God, you have a right perspective for who he is. And that right perspective of who he is brings in great integrity in your life, but also a deep sense of trust in God's sovereignty. Fear paralyzes us and become, can, can become a roadblock in our relationship with God. Anger can also be a major roadblock in our relationship with the Lord. Anger at other people, of course, we were mad at them. We can't believe they did that. I can't believe he got the promotion and I didn't. Did you hear what she said, right? And we just get so angry at other people. But I believe we also get very angry at God sometimes. I had a woman in my counseling office recently that said, I just want to punch God. And I just quickly, not thinking, just said, well, don't hurt your hand. And she said, what did you say? I said, he's big enough to take your anger. Don't hurt your hand. He he can take it. You you can say anything you want to, but don't, don't just go beating on his chest and saying, God, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. I can't believe this happened to me. Where were you? Where were you? Where were you? Staying in your anger at God and not allowing your honesty about your anger to transform your life. It makes me think about Jonah, that, that crazy prophet that we have a four-chapter book about in, in the Old Testament. We, we often think about his story and we're like, oh yeah, Jonah, the fish guy, right? He was the fish guy. He got swallowed by a fish and God showed amazing mercy to him, spit him right back out on land, headed straight towards Nineveh, the place he was supposed to go in the first place. He goes to Nineveh. He preaches a seven-word sermon, sees the whole city turn, but he's mad about it. In chapter four, he goes up onto the hill and creates a booth, right? Like imagine like a, I don't know, an IHOP kind of booth, right? He's sitting in a booth and and he's just comfortable and has this plant that grows over him and he's looking down just hoping that God's wrath will come down on Nineveh. So angry at God that finally he speaks his mind and says in Jonah chapter four, he says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. That is that God showed mercy to Nineveh. And he was angry. And he said, now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? He's committing some kind of spiritual suicide, saying, kill me now. I don't like that your mercy is for other people. He forgot how wonderful it was for him. 
God's mercy shown to him through being swallowed by a fish. God's mercy being shown to him to still be used to preach to Nineveh. God's mercy is all over Jonah's life. And finally, when God shows mercy to someone else, he gets mad about it and says, kill me now. And God so graciously says, does it do you well to be angry? He could have just said, done with you. Smashed him. Burned him, whatever, but he didn't. He asked him a simple question. Does it do you well to be angry? And the same question is for you today. If you're mad at God, if you're standing your anger, is a roadblock in your honesty, does it do you well to be angry? Is that really doing you well? Finally, I think a roadblock that stands in the way of our honesty with God is that of denial. I think that denial, as you've heard before, is not just a, a river in Egypt, right? It's a real place that we get to ourselves, and get in in ourselves where we're denying ourselves or, or denying other people the true authenticity that they're due. And certainly we're denying God the true authenticity and intimacy that he's due. We believe one thing and we do something else. I call this image management where we're trying to image manage. We're, we're trying to manage our image, what other people see of us, what other people think of us. Listen, Christ came to die for your soul. He didn't come to save your image. So why are we trying so hard to save it? Think about the things that we portray to other people. We try to show people that we're able. Look at my abilities. We try to show other people that we're stable. Look at me. Don't ask about my finances. Not going to tell you about that, but I'm stable. I'm good. We try to portray that we're knowledgeable, that we have all this great insight. We try to tell people that we're fashionable. Look at how I can dress. Look at what I can buy. We try to portray to people that we're personable or social, that we're good to be around, that they want to be our friend. But we also image manage, we have image management related to our relationship with God. We go into God to say, look how grateful I am. Thank you for this food. Thank you for this day. Or sorrowful after our sin, saying, oh, I'm sorry. I'll try not to do that again. We try to portray to him that we're useful. God, use me. Look at my skills. Place me there. Watch what I can do. Or we also try to portray to him that we're insightful. We go before God and, and, we, and we say, God, look what I found in your word. Look at how insightful this is. I, I discovered this. He's like, yeah, I wrote that. <laughs> but we try to tell him how insightful we are and all the while managing our image. These are roadblocks in our honesty to God. They keep us from being transformed by the power that he wants to unleash in our life. I believe it has to come down to this. It's the difference between accepting and acknowledging these things in our life. Accepting them is saying, oh, this is just the way that I am. These are going to stay this way. God, help me. But we don't really mean it. Acknowledging is saying, God, I know these things are in my life. I fear people more than I fear you. I manage my image when I pray to you. I'm not honest. I have sin that has a guilt the size of a semi-truck tied around my neck, help me. And we go before him and acknowledge these things and ask for him to truly transform our life. We see this model for us in scripture. The psalmists were amazing at this. The psalmists are the ones who wrote the 150 little chapters in the book of Psalms in the middle of our Bible. They, they were people that were so honest with God, most of which were David, but we have Asaph and some other psalmists in there. And I looked at the Psalms, about two-thirds of them could be categorized as lament Psalms, meaning that they were speaking honestly or lamenting before God. And as I looked further into those, I found that there was a model that we could follow in our own prayer life when it comes to being honest with God. It's this simple. You start by being honest with God. If you look at these Psalms, they're honest with him, saying, this is my fear, this is my doubt. Look at my enemy, what they're trying to do to me. Look at me, what I'm trying to do to my enemy. Look at the sin that's in my life. They're completely honest. But then they get to this point of recognizing God's faithfulness. They acknowledge that he is faithful and he can do with whatever he wants in our life. He, he is faithful to do his right things, righteous things in our life. And by acknowledging that, then they get to this place of praising him for being God. A great example of this is Psalm 73, if you'd like to look at it later. Asaph, this worship leader, starts with the first 15 verses of the passage, just speaking his honest thoughts to God, embittered that the unrighteous are getting all these blessings and he's keeping his life righteous and he's not getting any blessings. 
Then finally around 16 or 17, verse 16 or 17, he, his perspective changes. He sees God in his holiness as he is, and he says, my feet had nearly slipped. And then for the rest of the passage, he praises God for being God. It's a wonderful model that we can follow in our own life. The truth is the transformational honesty, honesty that will change us completely, has to believe and fully accept God's omniscience, meaning that he knows all things. If you're really going to be transformed by being fully honest with God, then you have to know he knows everything. He sees everything. I think so many times we put in our mind that I can go on sinning because this is so unholy and, and God's so holy, he's not even looking right now, and so I'll just keep eating the chocolate cake behind the couch hoping that I don't get caught by my heavenly father. Right? It's not like that. He sees everything, knows everything. In fact, I went into this professor, pastor that was on staff with me at a church a while back. His name was Bing Hunter. If you have a name like Bing Hunter, you know you're, you're just cool, right? He was cool. He always wore sweater vests and had a red beard and red hair and just looked smart. And so I thought, he's got to know the answer to this question. I went into his office. He had books everywhere and chairs, all, or no chairs, uh, books all over the floor. You had to sit on books that were shaped like chairs. Like that, that, that's how you had to converse with him. So I sat on my, at one of his stack of books and I said, can I ask you a question, Bing? He said, sure. I said, can I really be absolutely honest with God and it's not disrespectful or it doesn't, it doesn't make him mad? He, he, he leans across his, his book-filled desk and he says, Josh, let me ask you a question. I was like, oh man, I'm busted. This is not gonna go well. He goes, no, 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 listen. Let me, let me ask you, what can you tell a God who knows everything. And I was thinking nothing. And he goes, did you say nothing? And I said, well, I, I, don't, I mean, if he knows everything, then there's nothing really I can tell him. And he goes, no, you can tell him anything because he knows everything. We sat there in silence for a few minutes. I said, thank you. I got up and walked away because that truth was enough for my soul. To realize that he knows everything so I can say anything to him. When I have that kind of attitude, my life is changed. These roadblocks are broken down and now I can have an honest relationship with God that brings transformation. When I'm honest with God about my guilt and shame, he can bring freedom into my life. Paul wrote, for freedom Christ has come to set us free. We are free indeed in Christ. You see, we don't have to be tied to the things and mistakes of the past. We can experience true freedom, freedom ultimately in a relationship with God that is beautiful. Then when, when we go to God and, and we ask him to take away our depression or we're honest about our depression, he can impart in our life a deep sense of joy. Listen, there's a difference between joy and happiness. Happiness is all the right happenings in my life, but joy is being able to see God's perspective even when things are hard, even when I'm depressed, even when I feel like my life isn't worth it. I lived in Chicago for seven years of my life. I studied there and was a pastor there. I remember walking the streets of Chicago. I would often walk them at night when no, one, and no, no light was there so the people couldn't see the tears that were rolling down my face. And whenever there was a rainstorm, I made sure to go for a walk because people couldn't tell the difference between the raindrops and the teardrops that were running down my cheeks. I experienced some deep seasons of dep depression when I was in Chicago, feeling like there was no hope at times. What do I do? And I would walk those streets and just be honest with God and tell him what was going on in my life. And I found time and again, he would come in and say, so are you ready to give that to me? Because if you are, I'll give you joy. Again, it didn't mean that all the circumstances changed and life got instantly better, but joy was in my life, which was a difference of perspective. When we're honest with God about him being completely in control and us not being in control, when we let our pride go away and we have humility, then we can experience a much deeper and more beautiful relationship with God Almighty. Let me ask you a quick question. Who is God of the universe, God or you? Okay, that should be way easier than that. Who is God of the universe, God or you? God. God. God is. The problem is, at times we act like we are. We act like we have it all under control, like we're completely in control. 
When we go to him and we're honest and we say to him, Lord, you should be exalted as the highest above all, then he will come in and change our perspective, change our life, and make it more centered on him. King Nebuchadnezzar finally got to that place. He said, I praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. That's coming from a guy that was just an ox, now acknowledging that God is on the throne. When we're honest with God about our fear, we tell him what we're afraid of, he can come in and bring great comfort into our life. He's the wonderful counselor, right? He's the the great comforter. So whatever you're afraid of, people, circumstances, outcomes, whatever, you can trust him and he can bring great comfort into your life. It's beautiful when we're honest with him about fear, when we just speak it out to him and he says, I will bring great comfort into your life. When we're honest with him about anger, He can come into our life and give us great peace. We know that Jesus Christ himself was the prince of peace. And so we need him to hold us at the times where we're angry and we're mad. We're mad at God or mad at other people. And he says, can you just calm your heart down for a minute? Will you trust me? Let me give you peace. Listen, I'm ruling the world with my feet up, okay? I'm not worried about the outcome of this. Trust me is what he's saying. And he gives us great peace. And finally, when we're honest about the things in our life that we often are denying or in denial about, he can bring great authenticity into our relationship with him and other people. He can literally change our life to to be more intimate with him when we will finally drop the masks and drop the facades and say, God, here I am. You know me. You know my weaknesses and my strengths. You know all my cracks and crevices. Fill them in with the beauty of your Holy Spirit. So what do we do with this? What do we do with a message like this? How do we apply it to our life? Let me give you four things you could do this week that will help drive this home. First, you could spend time this week reading Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is the psalm that David wrote after he did what he did with Bathsheba. He was honest with God, but he relied on God's mercy and grace to wash over his life. So if you're dealing with sin and shame, you've got some things in your life you've got to get rid of, then spend time reading Psalm 51. I recommend you read it five times, maybe even read it in five different translations. But spend time reading Psalm 51. Second, you can write your honest to God thoughts out to God. Sometimes just getting things out on paper, I do it in a journal, you can do it in a letter, you can type it, whatever. But getting them out black and white and offering those to the Lord is so helpful. Write your thoughts to him and then give it over to him and say, okay, God, it's time for transformation to happen. Third thing you could do is spend 15 minutes a day in silence or solitude listening to him. We spend 15 minutes a day doing things a lot less important than that. But imagine this week, if just for the next six or seven days, you you just cut out 15 minutes a day to listen to God's voice. Sit in silence, maybe with your Bible and nothing else, and just say, God, what is it that you have for me? Speak to me and allow him to change the things in your life, transform them and speak truth into your life. Finally, there may be some deeply entrenched things in your life you need help with. You can't do it alone. Galatians tells us to get people that are help us. So seek pastoral care. I mean that both in the department here at Woodman. You have a pastoral care department that cares for you and and, and would love to help you. We can also seek help from other believers that can help you carry the burden in your life. I want to close with one last thing. I, I've been thinking about what job I want to have when I get to heaven. Have you thought about that? <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about it, and I, I've, I finally figured out what job I want when I get to heaven. I want to be the crown handler. <laughs> yeah, I have to believe there's a guy that's just in charge of the crowns and, and who has to bring them to Christ. And, and, and if, if that guy's there, I'm hoping that he'll give up his job for me because I really want that job when I get to heaven. And, and what I think will happen is you will get to heaven at some point and, and, and you'll show up and you'll walk. I don't know if it's down an aisle or what, but I, but I imagine that Christ is standing at the end of this aisle. And you come in and I, and I want to look over his shoulder and I want to see your face when you see him for the first time. I want to watch your eyes as as they light up and you realize that's your Savior standing before you. I want to see your face when you see Jesus. And then I want to watch you walk closer to him. And I I want to be the guy that he turns to and says, okay, give me so-and-so's crown. I'll be like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm on it, right? And I'll hand your crown to him. And he's going to take that crown and he's going to place it on your head and he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. 
you're home. And I want to see your face when he says that to you. And then I want to I want to see what I imagine you will do. I imagine that you will just fall to your knees and you will slip that crown off your head and you will place it at the feet of Christ because that's the only right place for it. And there you will begin for the rest of eternity the most authentic, beautiful relationship with him unhindered by anything earth has to offer. I want that job. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We can't wait for the day we get to see you face to face and be with you and experience your presence fully. I cannot wait for that day. But Lord, while I'm here on earth waiting to get there and all of us are, I I pray that you will help us enjoy unhindered intimacy with you. That you will help these roadblocks be obliterated and taken out of our life and that we will experience true freedom and joy and comfort and peace, that we will be authentic and by having this authenticity with you, we will have more of you because that's really what we want, God. It's really what I want. I just want more of you now and I can't wait to be with all of you forever. So I pray that for my brothers and sisters in this room. I pray that they will be honest this week, that they will seek you, Lord, and have your comfort and your grace and your mercy applied to their life in a way maybe they've never experienced it before. We love you, Father, in your name. Amen.